Hi everyone, my name is Andre and welcome back to another educational video from Med School EU. Today we are jumping into another chemistry topic from the IMAT specifications and that's going to be the periodic table of elements. We're going to take a look at how the periodic table is structured. So here we have our periodic table. Now the, the color coding here is perfectly designed for us to showcase how it is actually structured and why the elements are in the positions that they are in. Well, first we got to recall what elements are. All of these, every single one of these different letters and different name is an element, different element. Now what are elements? Elements are simply a collection of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So they have just different numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons, but they're all still composed of the same components, these three. So the most basic structure of the periodic table, the most basic subdivision of these different types of elements is going to be between the, this staircase. Now this staircase is going to split up the metals from the non-metals. So every single element on this periodic table falls under the category of a metal or a non-metal. And there are going to be elements that are somewhat in between, like the ones that are on the periodic table. But all the other ones will be classified metal or non-metal. Now, if we're looking at the subdivision here, the right side of the staircase is gonna be non-metals. And all of the elements on the left side of the staircase will be metals, excluding the hydrogen. Hydrogen is a non-metal. So if you're looking at this here, everything all around here is going to be a metal. Everything on this side is going to be a non-metal. Now also, all of these metals and non-metals are generally gathered into groups based on their properties. So what gives these elements their properties? Well, that's going to be the protons, the electrons, and the neutrons. The number of these sub these subparticles that are within the, the elements are going to give each of the elements its specific types of properties and its specific type of uh, phase that it's in, whether it's a gas, it's a liquid, or it's a solid, and whether it's a metal or a non-metal. That all depends on the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons that are on this periodic table in each of the elements that are outlined. Now, the most basic way to organize the, the periodic table is to go by its atomic number. The atomic number is stated right there, right in, on top of the uh, element symbol. So what we have is our hydrogen is the first element, helium, then lithium, then beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. So the way these are structured is the atomic number, and this is something we've discussed in the previous lecture, the atomic number is going to give the number of electrons and protons within that element, which will also give it specific properties. Now, these elements are largely going to be split into different groups that will have very, very similar properties. Now, the first thing to know, what is a group? Well, the periodic table is going to be split into groups that are going to align in this, this way. So this would be a group right there. This is the second group. This is the third group, fourth group, and so on. And your periods are going to be aligned this way. In other words, this is going to be the first period, second period, third period, fourth period, and so on. Now that we know what groups and periods are, we can identify what these elements fall, fall under which category of groups that will have very similar properties. And we're going to discuss those physical and chemical properties in this lecture as well. The first group on the periodic table that will have very similar properties amongst themselves, so the hydrogen, the lithium, sodium, potassium, and all of these elements that are going down this way are gonna be group number one and they will be called the alkali metals. Now moving on to the second one, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and the rest of these would be classified under the second group, and this group is going to be called alkaline earth metals. The next category that is going to outline all of these metals that are falling within this box over here, this block, is going to be the transition metals. So this is going to include several groups combined together that will have very similar properties amongst themselves. Now we've talked about the division of this staircase right here and everything that happens on the left side of the staircase but not including the transition metal. So everything that's kind of all around here like this 
these ones are going to be classified as other metals. So they will be just sim just basically metals that will have other properties from the transition metals, the alkaline earth metals, and the alkali metals. They will have their own special properties. Now, if we're looking at the subdivision here, these elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and uh, selenium, these ones right here are going to be called other non-metals. Now, this group right here of the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, these, this is a very special group that's very reactive. They're gonna be called halogens. And the last category right here are going to be called noble gases. So these are the major subdivisions you should know about the periodic table, how it is structured, and why are these things grouped into these particular parts of the periodic table? Well, they are grouped like that because they all exhibit similar trends. They exhibit similar properties based on the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons that they have. Although they all have a different number, but because of the number that they do have, they were going to have similar properties. And this is something that we're going to see later on in the video. So now the properties that I mentioned earlier about these groups that are organized in the periodic table, they're going to be based off of chemical and physical properties. So before we jump into the chemical and physical properties of each of these groups, we first need to know what are chemical and physical properties. So what is their distinctions? The chemical properties are properties that change the substance's chemical entity. Now, what is a chemical entity? Well, some examples are going to include acidity, reactivity, flammability, bonding, uh, heat, toxicity, oxidation, etc. Now, if we're thinking of the physical properties of these elements, the physical properties are uh, properties that do not change the substance's chemical entity. So chemical uh, properties change the substance chemically, whereas physical properties are properties that you can identify that will not go, that are not going to change the substance chemically. So examples of physical properties are gonna include color, density, mass, volume, length, shape. Now, as you can see, like the easiest way to think about this, because this is easy to get confused, the, the easiest way that I think about this is the physical properties are going to just describe what something looks like, whereas chemical properties are going to describe how it's going to change in a different environment or when something is applied to it or when it reacts with something or when it produces a gas when something chemically changes that's a chemical property physically it's more of like okay i'm looking at it the color is blue the the it's heavy so the density is is high or the mass is high or it takes up a lot of volume or uh, it, it's shaped in a circle whatever happens to be it's more descriptive whereas chemical properties are more about the change that occurs chemically to that substance. So now let's talk about the physical and the chemical properties of alkali metals. Well, alkali metals are going to be soft metals. They're going to have low density, so they will float on water. They're going to have very low melting points and boiling points, meaning that you can melt them or boil them at low temperatures. They are good conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, these metals tend to be shiny. They are very highly reactive. The, the reason they're highly reactive is because they only have one electron in their outer shell and they're easily going to give up that electron to become stable. And this is something we've discussed previously, but we will go into this in more detail in the next videos about bonding. They uh, react with water to form hydrogen gas and a, and a metal of, uh, of hydroxide ions. So it's gonna form a strong base. And as, acids and bases is something we're gonna talk about later, but a special type of uh, property that they have is they react with water to form this gas, hydrogen gas, and a base that's going to have a metal, some sort of metal, and an OH added to it. Now looking at the second group that is right here, we're gonna have our alkaline earth metals. And alkaline earth metals are going to be 
uh, more dense than the first group, so their density is going to be a little higher than the first group uh, alkali metals. They're also going to be great conductors of heat and electricity. And generally, conductivity of heat and electricity is a general property of metals. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, whereas non-metals are poor conductors of heat and electricity, meaning they're going to be insulators. Uh, now, uh, alkaline earth metals are going to be reactive, but their reactivity is going to be less than group 1. Now, something special about these elements is that calcium, strontium, barium, and radium are so so these last last few are going to be react vigorously able to react with water to form hydrogen gas and beryllium is one of the metals in this in this part of in this group that isn't going to react now looking at the transition metals they're going to be good conductors of course they are metals now these metals are going to be malleable and what this means is they could be bent into shape this is when you can use your uh, elements like iron or nickel and bend them into different shapes that we use in our everyday lives. Now these metals are going to have high melting points and high boiling points. These metals are obviously going to be hard. They're not going to be softer metals like the alkaline earth metals or uh, the uh, alkaline metals. They will be a lot more dense so the density will be higher and their reactivity is going to vary. The reason it's going to vary in, in reactivity, and we're going to learn about the reactivity series as well, is because all of these are grouped into different columns, different groups, and they're going to have a different number of electrons hanging in the valence shell. Therefore, their reactivity is going to be greatly different. Now, another thing to point out is that the transition metals are going to be multivalent. Now, what multivalent means is they could have multiple charges. For example, iron has two plus charge or a three plus charge. And this would depend on the iron that we're specifically talking about that is going to give up two electrons or give up three electrons. And this is something that we will discuss in great detail in the coming lectures. Now, looking at the other side of the staircase, We've got the halogens, which would be in group seven. And the halogens are going to be typically toxic elements, looking at fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. They're also going to make acids with hydrogen gas. They're going to be extremely reactive. And, and fluorine, chlorine and fluorine are one of the most reactive elements on the periodic table. Fluorine being the most reactive element on the periodic table and they're going to be very highly reactive with other metals. And this reaction with metals is going to form salts. Now, the halogens are going to have low boiling points and uh, melting points. Uh, that, that is going to be relative to the metals that we have discussed previously. Uh, these elements are going to be colorful and uh, they're going to exhibit all three states, meaning that they will be in the solid, liquid, and gas. So I believe fluorine and chlorine are going to be typically classified as a gas at STP, uh, whereas bromine is going to be a liquid and iodine is a solid at STP. And the final group, the last group, group eight, are going to be the noble gases. And these are very special elements because they're going to be stable. No other group of elements is going to be as stable as the noble gases. And the reason they're stable is because they're going to be non-reactive, they're inert. And the reason for that is because they already have a full octet. They're gonna have eight electrons in their outer shells and they're not going to wanna give any electrons up and they will not wanna gain any electrons. Therefore, they're not going to be very reactive. So their reactivity is gonna be extremely low. Now these uh, gases are gonna be colorless, they will be odorless, and they will be tasteless. They'll often be non-flammable, so they will not be, you cannot light them on fire at regular uh, temperatures and pressures. They're also going to have low melting points and low boiling points compared to the other elements that we've discussed. And in general, these elements are just unreactive. Most of them are going to be inert, and that is their special property. So this concludes the lecture for today. In the next one, we are going to take a look at the periodic trends 
of the periodic table of elements.